It could be anything. I was uh, listening to a conversation about Sammy, and I was intrigued by the by the idea the idea that um, a lot of things that are difficult to speak about uh, come through in, in poetry and, and metaphor uh, much better. And uh, I just I think about trying to digest those things when I was younger just being kind of annoyed by them because they didn't make uh, they didn't make logical sense to me and how as I get older I find those to be more and more interesting and informative um, and how I see those metaphors in even even some some modern uh, art film and Music and, um, yeah, just, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking. I don't know what I'm asking. I guess maybe some sources for some, some more art that may, that may elicit that. Some of you may have already seen this on um, YouTube. I may have posted them, I don't know. But there was a guy around the 19th century, his name is Thomas Cole. You know, he has these four paintings. They're quite beautiful. The Voyage of Life. Where the first one, which he titles as Childhood, he had this kid on a boat, the water is calm, there's an angel on the boat, there's an hour clock or a sand clock. Behind the boat is, I mean, the boat comes from this cave, out of this cave, it's dark, it's gloomy. Uh, the cave itself is quite rocky, there is nothing living. Hello. And so, but the kid is happy. He's naked, he's having a good time. It's inside the boat, it's quite lush. There's an angel protecting this kid. And to some extent, you could say it's a very artistic, creative, poetic way of describing what a childhood really is. That's granting if, you know, uh, this kid who's born doesn't have serious disabilities, you know, physical, especially, has relatively good parents where, uh, negative triggers are not created inside him at such or her at a very, very young age. So this kid can kind of just live out his innocent days for uh, a few years. And it's, it's a very innocent way of being happy. You know, if you ask a, I don't know, a two-year-old why are you happy, it's, it's a stupid question. And two-year-olds are supposed to be happy. They're, everything about life is mysterious for them. It's exciting for them. The second painting is, I think it's called Youth. And it's, you know, like all of us. We imagine that now that you can walk, you can cross the street. Now that you know how to run, maybe you can ride your bicycle. And youth brings this arrogance with it. And that just because you have some relative autonomy, you can go here and there. And so whoever is your life, is in your life, you push them out. Whether it's your parents, whether it's an angel or God or religion or faith, whatever the case may be. And you get on this boat and what you don't see because your vision as a young adult, it's so immediate. You only see what's in front of you. We don't look ahead to see that the, the water is no longer as calm and the path is no longer straight, it's winding. 
It's going to be somewhat confusing. We don't see any of that. Good morning. All you know is that, you know, you assume that you have the resources to go out there and get married, to go out there and buy a house, even though you don't have a job or lease out a car, whatever the case may be. And, you know, like all young people, you have one leg forward and your fist is clenched. I suppose symbolically telling the universe that you can do what you put your mind in, you know, on, uh, that nothing can stop you. You're like the Terminator. And far in the distance in the sky, there is this like temple of Taj Mahal. And you don't have to really be young. You could be young in experience. You could be a 60 year old man like me who's never been married, but all of a sudden finds himself attracted to a young woman or a young man and says, okay, I want to get married. That's a Taj Mahal. It's a place where hopes and dreams come true. They haven't been tested. They haven't yet been grounded to be challenged by life. All you know is that it's up there and you have enough energy and enough hopes and dreams to reach whatever it is you desire. And then you have manhood. The sky is gloomy. The water is definitely not calm. Your hair is long, your beard is grown. You don't have time to cut your hair or shave your face. And your bends are now, your knees are now bent for a different reason, not because you're confident, but because you've lost confidence. And you know what's ahead, it's like Niagara Falls. <coughs> and you may have been an atheist, you may have been a fake religionist, but now your fists, your hands are clenched. Are you praying? You want some help. This is out of your control. You have no power to control anything, as most of us feel once in a while. And again, this has nothing to do with being young or old. Whenever you find yourself in a circumstance in which you have zero control, you really pray for some invisible help to come down and kind of help you figure out what you need to do next. And then you have old age, you know, your innocence has been robbed by life, your dreams have been shattered by life, you've tried to calm the rough waters of life only to realize that sometimes you can be victorious, other times you're just demolished by life and now at this age, you know, where you are in life, you all you have to do is just sit. All you can do really is just sit on the boat. The water is calm. And there are some tiny openings in the sky. The clouds um, have moved away a little bit. And you can see the sunshine coming through. And the angels are coming down. It's really your death. And you are accepting your ending with a good amount of calmness and self-respect and dignity. I don't know how long it took Thomas Cole to have those four paintings, uh, but I suppose if I was to create a scenario about this, I would say the following. I'm not quite sure if it's uh, true for Thomas Cole or not, but let me just say, for all some of us in this class who have kids, or some of us in this class who've had dreams and hopes untested by life, you know, you kind of walk into every new episode in life quite innocently. Good morning. And you assume that no harm is gonna to come to you. You know, you and I have kids. Once in a while, it's not a bad idea to just go back while you're a child asleep, or maybe while he's playing video games or drawing or whatever the case may be, just look at him and Take your memory back all the way to when he was one or two or three, you know. He would want to go to the bathroom and say, Dad, can you come with me? He said, son, you're like pooping. I know, Dad, but can you just come and stand next to me and we can maybe have a conversation? You say, okay. And there is not a hint of shame about him. He doesn't care, you know. What's organic for him is categorized by you as something negative. It's something that he needs to be in the privacy of the bathroom all by himself. You know, he runs around, breaks things. He says, make me French fries or make me coffee or whatever the case may be. And he just kind of looks at it and says, okay, dad, I, I looked at it. I'm full now. Really? 
I spent like five hours making this dish for you and you don't want to eat it? No, I don't want to eat it. And then, of course, being an adult, knowing the difficulties of making money and, you know, all the other complexities, you look at your kid and say, ah, privileged, entitled. You know, he's lucky he wasn't born in my time. He wouldn't have survived. But that is the innocence of being a child. And the truth is, you can't sit and explain things to him. You can't tell him how innocent he is, how organic he is. I mean, he's one of the most organic entities in life. You know, he hasn't yet been corrupted by the social adult world we call the civilized world. You know. And then comes, and you and I will both experience this or have already, uh, that your child is now a young kid, whether he's nine and can ride a bicycle or when he's 18 and he has the funds to buy whatever. And he has dreams and hopes. And you as a parent sit down and say, son, listen to me. I know you have 20,000 bucks in your savings account. It's really nothing. Don't waste it on a car. But your child doesn't listen, as no child listens. You know, they think that their parents are jerks and nerds and their teachers are far worse. And the only thing that they have on their focus is the Taj Mahal, the Tesla they want to buy, the girlfriend they're in love with, uh, the school that they want to go to, and therefore they want to drop out and journey through Yosemite, or as Trump would say, Yosemite. And it doesn't matter how much you talk to your kid, how much you plead with him, how much you scream, how much you shout, how much you expose your frustration, anxiety, dread, anger, he just won't get it. And then there comes a point where your son calls you out of the blue after like two, three, four, five years, say, Dad, you know, you were right. Life is really, really tough right now. I'm going through a difficult time. Can you help me? I say, well, what the hell do you need? I just need you to come and stay with me. I have a job. I need to pay mortgage. There is your mom. There are your siblings. And your kid ultimately finds himself completely alone and isolated. And there isn't much you can do. And then the only thing you probably can do is, you know, I took a class a long time ago, philosophy with this guy, Amir Sabzavari, who's now dead. He gave me some audio lectures by various professors around the country and the world. I'm going to send them to you, download Telegram, and you hope that it's a shot in the dark that one of those talks that you'll send him will inspire him, will motivate him perhaps to change his path in life, but he's all alone now. And then uh, the last painting is really just about you. It's a glimpse about your own future. You struggle uh, in your young adult life to kind of figure things out, to make sure that you don't commit too many errors in life. But that's not possible. That's not the way human beings work because we don't have a manual. You know, it's not like you go to Ikea, open a box, there is this like a booklet and you follow step one through 95, and then you have this beautiful, magnificent bookshelf, or bookcase. And so since you're bound to make mistakes, and you struggle to make them right with yourself, with your parents, with your wife, with your kids, and then you, know, you get to be 60 perhaps, you're tired, you're exhausted, and all you do is you just sit in this boat of life. And you just wait for death to come your way. And you're not bitter. You've kind of moved on from the stage of bitterness and anger and depression. You have now the wisdom and the insight to kind of review, you know, your life. And to some extent understand why things unfolded the way they did. And I'm guessing, you know, sometimes... Um, I do my best to put myself in a reflective mood so I can sit, think, and write perhaps, and maybe feel some, maybe great emotions, profound emotions, but I can't. And then I have this piano music, and I have some of the saddest Persian song music that I, I collected over the years. And within like a few minutes, I am placed in the mood that I desire. It's sad, it's melancholic, now I can sit, and kind of just begin to examine and reflect. And if I am capable, maybe sit and put some of my emotions in language. And sometimes, you know, you have to sit back and wonder why is it that, why is it so difficult to kind of come to class and use language as a way to inspire people, to educate people for like hours, and it doesn't work. And then 
you put on a movie for two hours, or maybe you cut a section of the movie, you know, it's a two minute clip, or you listen to certain scores by Beethoven, or uh, painting by some of the great painters, you know, and all of a sudden the mood that would be created inside you after many, many hours, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe years of work, all of a sudden created within five minutes. You know, artists are privileged enough to have the craft to, I suppose, impose their feelings and emotions or house them in painting or poetry and then throw it at the rest of us. And the rest of us have no choice but to be profoundly attracted to them. And then you would want to decipher them. You know, um, why is it, hello Emerson, why is it T.S. Eliot calls his work the wasteland? Why? Why is it the wasteland? What does it mean? You know? uh, and maybe writing is an act of desperation. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's something we talked about in class yesterday. Someone was asking about why do we invest ourselves in other people? You know, my, my job is just to talk. It's a very cheap profession. Not to act on the things I say, but just to talk. And I've been at it for well, 30 years or so. There comes a point you just get tired. I don't want to see my own reflection in other people. I really don't care. I'm far too tired for people to look at me and say, yes, that's right. No, that's wrong. To go back and forth with them. You don't like me, fine. You like me, okay. And sometimes I take comfort in sitting in my office, not opening the door to anyone, not replying to any emails, and simply write. It seems that my most faithful companion at this stage is simply my desktop. And I think it's just a gradual process that little by little you are like Noah, the ark, you know, where God tells Noah that, listen, I'm going to create a flood. You used to see your own reflection in your wife. I'm going to drown your wife, metaphorically speaking. Her love for you no longer means anything. Her food, uh, care for you no longer means anything. I'm also going to drown your kids. Love them. But what they think of you don't really mean much anymore. And you're ambitious for them, ambitions for them, that doesn't really mean much. For, and you have to be on this ark all by yourself. The flood is coming. And you have to be profoundly self-reliant. You know, I mean, people talk about Henry David Thoreau, the student of Emerson, who fancied his teacher's wife, but that's besides the point. Now, you know, David Thoreau didn't live, stay on the Walden Pond for like 5, 10, 20, 15 years. No, we just stayed for a couple of weeks. And only like a minute away from the city. He writes a couple of things and then comes back. You know, and then the deception in his writing is let the trees dance for you. Be sufficient in that. Let the wind be your music. You know, and the truth is they are beautiful mirages that poets create for us. It's something that Plato, the Greek philosopher some almost 3,000 years ago, warned all of us. Do not trust poets. Do not trust artists. They are nothing but bumper stickers. They tell us about happiness, about comfort, about it's my Zen moment, you know? And so you pursue, you become a donkey and they hold a carrot in front of you. And you pursue this carrot and you will never get it. You know, even someone like Jesus, who's never married, who doesn't know what attachment really is, who doesn't have kids, so he doesn't know really what love is, loving your child, worrying about his or her future. He's not around to see his parents age, you know, so he doesn't have compassion in that regards either. He's all about God, he's all about his own agenda. He's profoundly selfish. And for him it's really, really good, and if he can get there, 
more power to you. You know, it's far better for you to be detached from your parents now than be profoundly attached, see them get old, see them get sick, see them get die, and then all of a sudden you realize you're devastated by the passing of your parents, and now you're profoundly depressed and unreachable by your wife, by your friends, even by yourself. And you sit in this room, this hole, in this darkness, you know, and you just weep for days until the emotions pass by. And if you can find in yourself a Jesus or a Buddha that says, you know what? I'm going to look at my parents. They're healthy. They're beautiful people. But they've done their job. They gave me food. They gave me clothes. They gave me a roof over my head. From this point on, I have the energy, the stamina, the cunningness to some extent, the intelligence to go out there and just experiment with life. And you move away. You know, and then you hear your parent is dead. So, okay, well, you know, I'm sorry that they died. They were great people, you know. You know, it reminds me of a story of Ramana Maharshi when he left his... Did I tell you the story of Ramana Maharshi? It doesn't really matter, but, you know, he left his mom at a very, very young age, and his mom was heartbroken. And he pursued... She pursued to find him, but to no avail. Eventually, her mother has cancer, and she only has a few weeks to live. And she kind of spreads the word, if any of you have seen my son, Ramana, if you, any of you know where he is, can you please tell me so I can at least die in peace? You know, if uh, you have seen the movie, um, what is that movie? Achilles. Is it Achilles? With Brad Pitt? Troy. That's right. Thank you, Chandler. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a scene where Peter O'Toole, who has witnessed his son die by the hands of Achilles, Brad Pitt. But Brad Pitt, you know, drags his body around and Peter O'Toole goes to him and says, let me give my son a proper burial. Let me put two gold coins on his eyes. Let me see him go to the gods peacefully. Give me my son back. And that's what Ramana Maharshi's mother is saying, that you know, let me find my son so I can at least die in peace. And when she eventually finds him, Ramana comes to realize that she's going to die. And so he holds her in, her arm, in his arms and he places his right hand on her chest and helps her die peacefully, you know. And, and you're talking about a guy who left his mom who at the age of maybe 12 or 13, if I'm not mistaken, and so you have about maybe 40 years of not seeing your mom. And as you don't see someone, the narratives that used to bond you to another human being begin to kind of loosen their grips over you. And then you see your mom and you have an explosion of emotions. But because you've been engaged in perhaps self-refinement, figuring out who you are, what you are, are you your body, are you your flesh, are you your history, you know, are you your culture? And when you come to realize, no, maybe you don't, you're not any of those things. You're like this onion. You know, the layers, one layer, one skin of the onion is your culture. The other is your upbringing. The other is your town. The other are your parents. The other are your siblings. The other is your wife. And when you get rid of all of this stuff, you realize you are nothing. And if you're nothing, your emotions mean nothing. Your thoughts mean nothing. There is no reason for you to come to class and talk about anything because you're nothing. Nothing means anything. Okay? And accept those moments. And those moments are, before I tell you about those moments, um, there is this beautiful poem by Abu Sa'id Abu Khair. چون دایره ماز پوست پوشان تویم در دایره حلقه به گوشان تویم گر بن وازی زجان خوشان تویم ورنن وازی هم از خموشان تویم That I'm like this instrument. I'm not going to be played by Beyonce. I'm not going to be played or make a sound just in case Miley Cyrus holds me. I don't care about those people. If I'm a guitar, if Paul McCartney holds me and plays me, I will make noise. And what this poem says is, I'm like this drum, I'm like this instrument. 
I am not going to put myself in the hands of people. I don't trust them. I don't like them. I'm not going to put myself in the hands of politics or politicians. I'm not going to put myself in the hands of education and educators. I'm going to put myself in the hands of life. I trust life. The organicness of life. You know, it's what Lao Tzu would call, you know, give yourself to life. Allow life to guide you. Not politics, not society, not other human beings. Be a child. But a child who has gone through being simply an infant, being stupid, being organic. You have to kind of go through all these stages to become a different kind of a child. You're innocent, but it's a very refined way of being. It's a very refined way of thinking. And so he says, if life holds me, if life beats me, I will make sounds. You know. But if there are things out there that feel and sound a little alien, I won't get close to them. Um, long story short, um, You know, even though I think artists have a great way of presenting beautiful images, profound images, uh, they're not very practical. You know, Khalil Gibran, he has this wonderful poem. He's a Lebanese guy, sketches well, paints well. Uh, and writes beautifully. He's immaculate. It's really, really amazing. But children and parents are like bows and arrows. You know. Once the arrow leaves the bow, you have no idea where it's going to go. And though children may come out of you, they don't belong to you. And this is coming, I mean, it's a beautiful thing and it's true. What the hell do you do with the emotions that you have as a father? Why can he say it? He is not married. He doesn't have children. You know, um, it's like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He has this beautiful book, Emile, about education. 300 pages. He had nine kids. He didn't raise a single one of them. He doesn't know what it means to be a parent. He doesn't know what it means to be a father. Uh, he writes about society. He writes about the best education for kids. You know. And then you have to kind of sit back and wonder, where, who should we believe? What should we believe? And maybe the great Taoist philosopher Chong Su is right. Maybe if you want to come to a place of certainty, maybe you should carry the sword of doubt for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Doubt everything. You know, if you want to kind of look at a very systematic, scientific way of doubting, read the meditations by Rene Descartes around the 17th century. I and mean, it's a weird time because religion is losing its power and grip over people. And the scientific revolution is now at a faster pace. It's more powerful. And there is this huge friction between religion and science. And they're going to wrestle to see who's going to be dominant. And eventually, of course, science wins. Uh, and, but, you know, he sits back, Descartes. Uh, of course, Chinese philosophy very much like, I mean, any non-Western philosophy is profoundly exotic. You know, it's like Angelina Jolie. She has, just has a very exotic way about her. And so it captivates you. Rene Descartes is not very exotic. He's kind of dry. He is a 17th century, like, Western philosopher, uh, even though he had some interesting dreams that something like God appeared to him and said, Descartes, you know, you're going to change the world. You're going to change philosophy. No one is going to be doing philosophy or looking at philosophy the way it used to. Everything is going to change. But all other side, he kind of sits back and says, okay, what exactly can I doubt? Does... Do I exist? Well, you've had dreams. And in the dreams, you thought yourself that these dreams are actually quite real. Could you sitting in this classroom be a dream? It's a stupid way of looking at things, but nevertheless. The point is doubt everything. 
And then his conclusion is, well, does God exist? Is God good? If God is good, can he deceive? Is deception part of being good? The answer is no. So God exists. If God exists, this can be a dream. There are many, many faulty conclusions and just many, many faulty steps that he takes. And it's maybe because I'm from the Middle East and I gravitate towards more, uh, towards Eastern philosophy. <clears throat> and since everything around you creates nothing but mirages, carry the sort of doubt, doubt everything, doubt your teachers, doubt yourself. Uh, but you have to have this intense zest for truth, for understanding, whatever that may be, you know. Going back to your original question, artists. Niki o badi ke dar nahad bashar ast. Good and evil that lives in the psyche of the human being. It's one line. It's by Omar Khayyam. One line. He doesn't need to explain what good is. He doesn't need to explain what bad is. He just tells you. If you want to know universal truth, it's this. Good and bad lives inside you. And you say, yeah, that's, you know what? There's a reason why there is injustice in Oakland sometimes. There's a reason why sometimes people act compassionately. Nikki Obadi. But does he talk about the social structure? No. Does he talk about culture? No. Does he talk about customs? No. Everything kind of gets condensed in five words. Um, I think ultimately, if, if anyone in this class really desires to understand things relatively well, and it's always limited and it's always relative, uh, watch the talks of Jordan Peterson. You know, despite the fact that he is contaminated now, and that's what fame does to all of us, uh, he's able to kind of articulate art or the emotions that live inside you in ways that are really quite magical and magnificent. And there is something about him, you know, he used to be a drunk, he used to be depressed, his family was somewhat dysfunctional, so were his parents and grandparents, if I'm not mistaken. He taught psychology at, at, at Toronto for many, many years. And he got famous, he got lucky, you know. Uh, the language police had told him that he needs to kind of use they and them and theirs and this and that, all that. He said, no, I'm not going to have the government tell me how to use language. Anyways, he went before, you know, some politicians and that's where he got his fame. But the point I'm trying to make is, <clears throat> very much like the Buddha, you know, he's going to tell you why we suffer. We don't suffer because of God. We don't suffer because of society. Uh, you suffer because you expect. You suffer because you attach. You know, you suffer because of your five senses. You suffer because of your memories. You suffer because you think that you are your body and your history and your culture. And if you're able to get all, rid of all of those, and there are these beautiful ways that the Buddha talks about it, you know. Uh, but it's not like one of these new age teachers, you know, that you YouTube who says, but be detached. What the hell does that mean, be detached? You know, attachment is the cause of suffering. I understand that. How does attachment come about? How does detachment come about? It's something that I think Chandler talked about, right? Oh, no, no, Deviante. Uh, and so he has this, like, wheel of life. He tells you how desires, how, how attachments come about. You know, you have a desire, but then you pursue it, then it begins to live inside you, and then you act it out, then you get bored, then you get dissatisfied, and the satisfaction is a place of emptiness, boredom, and then you say, what the hell am I gonna do with this empty space? It's like walking into your house, and there are no sofas, there are no chairs. What do you do? Well, you go to Ikea and you fill it up. And that's what happens when you get bored. Your interior has nothing left in it. So you have to go somewhere, find a desire that's interesting, pursue the desire. These are the sofas and the chairs and the tables of our lives. And the Buddha argues, well, you know, don't have anything. And just in case you want to have things in your house, give them zero value. 
And if you give them zero value, you have them today, you lose them tomorrow, you won't feel anything. And you go about 20, 30 years of such dialogue with the Buddha. You know, uh, there was a, a book. I'm sorry, before I continue rambling on, which is giving me a headache. Any questions from out, Gurmit? Um, I was just wondering about uh, from Gurmit. Uh, there were two. The first one was uh, for when you were in the city, you were dumb. And uh, the second one was the shake who played with children. I don't know if you have heard about that one. The shake who played with children. I don't know. So, um, I just wanted to like talk about this topic. Okay. The, this poem for when you have attained fixity, you are dumb. When you have attained fixity, you are dumb. Yeah. <sighs> okay. May I just before we talk about? Uh, I don't know what this poem is. Sometimes my parents and I go to Costco or Home, Dep Home Depot and my parents, despite being here for 40 years, they speak very broken English. And so they say, Amir, can you tell this person that I want A, B, C, D? All in Persian. And then I have to translate. I look at this guy and I say, whatever. But when you decode or unpack my translation, it's not really what my parents said. It's close, but it's really not exact. <clears throat> you have people in the West, someone like Coleman Barks, someone like Deepak Chopra. Now, these people don't speak Persian. Good morning, Abhi. So what happens is someone like Coleman Barks or Deepak Chopra looks at not the Persian, Rumi, the Persian translation into English of Rumi and says, okay, you know what? I'm going to look at the English. I'm going to change them a little bit. So it can kind of go the way I want it to go. Uh, 